there will be some impact. Uh, I think the key is going to be what the revenue shortfall is on the government um, and also whether they meet their disinvestment target. I think the, the issue has been that inflation has fallen so much that nominal GDP growth this year could be a little, even less than 10%. The government had budgeted 13.4% in its budget. So clearly tax collections for that reason will be under pressure. Apart from the fact that tax buoyancy will be lower if nominal GDP goes to lower. So the way to, but I have no doubt they'll meet their fiscal deficit number. And the way they'll go about that is by cutting expenditures. But yes, to the, the more expenditures need to be cut to meet the fiscal deficit, uh, there will be some impact on aggregate demand. Uh, there will be some impact on the rural economy. I think the rural economy more generally has seen a normalization of real wages. So that's impacting uh, rural demand at the moment. No, no, it's not just the base effect. I think the momentum of inflation has genuinely decelerated in the last three months, and it's, it's clear to see why. Uh, the monsoon got dramatically better in September. Uh, the government, to its credit, has worked hard on the cereals front. So uh, minimum support prices only went up 3 to 5% for four successive crop cycles. Uh, you've seen the Food Corporation of India actually selling rice and wheat. So cereals inflation has come down quite a lot and oil prices have collapsed, you know, $40. So I think that's clearly helped the momentum. I guess the risk going forward, there are three questions the central bank will want to sort of answer going forward. You know, does the commodity disinflation sustain or will that reverse soon? Um, B, more importantly, given the weight in the basket, is the food disinflation seasonal and cyclical or is it structural? That is still not known to anybody. More data is required. If the food disinflation is in fact structural and it remains at six or seven percent, not at 10 percent where it's been for the last 10 years, then that six percent target looks eminently achievable. Right? And the third will be if and when growth does accelerate, what happens to pricing power, what happens to core inflation. So I think at this point the risks are balanced, but you know, I don't see it, even given where oil prices are, I don't see much space for monetary easing in 2015, especially given that the medium term target is four percent with a band and at six percent you're at the very edge, the upper edge of that band. It's, it's, it's a significant drag on the economy, it's a significant threat. And I think what we have to essentially now um, uh, partition is there is some subset of that group uh, which can recover and which can become economic uh, if growth picks up. So there's a cyclical component to this, you know, a rising tide will lift all boats. Uh, to the extent that GDP growth picks up and some of these implementation bottlenecks get resolved by the government, some of these projects that are stalled will get completed, there'll be cash flows, uh, they can raise equity, they can delever. But that's a long process. But there perhaps is another subset here which will not be economic under any conditions. And so you require that creative destruction, so to speak, of capital. And we'll, the, the sooner we can recognize that, the less will be the overhang of non-performing assets. You see, the problem today is even if the demand for credit picks up and the investment cycle picks up, um, there is a, a great issue with push factors, that there's a great degree of risk aversion on the part of public sector banks to finance any infrastructure given the weight of the non-performing assets. So until those issues are resolved, it's hard to see a sustainable or sharp pickup uh, in investment or growth.